about 1977, I would assume that some of you were just little children then, uh, a group of people uh, largely led by my wife and my brother-in-law Bob and Carl Tuttle uh, assembled in a house and uh, began praying. They were worn out Pharisees. They had studied the Bible so much and taught the Bible very effectively. They probably along with myself, probably won two or three thousand people to Christ and planted a lot of churches and did a lot of things, but they had just simply worn out. And um, they, they got together, and I had kind of been lifted out of the circle and was traveling around America ostensibly as a church growth expert. I don't know if I was or wasn't. I never have figured that out. But people thought I was, so I guess that's about the same thing, isn't it? And um, they said, you know, we, we just, we just got to get back to God. We don't, we've lost our joy. We've lost our relationship to a large degree. We know we're not unsaved. We haven't lost our salvation, but we aren't having much fun anymore. And so they began meeting in this house, and within about seven or eight weeks, the house was just packed. Uh, all the hallways, the all the rooms, the bedrooms and bathrooms and kitchen and just people everywhere you could get them and people sitting outside or kneeling outside at the windows looking in. Southern California gets rather warm in the summertime, uh, but it's a dry heat and so they can take it a little more of it than others. But there'd be nights when that house I'm sure was 110 degrees. So it wasn't uh, for the faint heart. You know, uh, people would come and and they didn't do much. Uh, the Holy Spirit began instructing them and, and giving them things that really became, became cornerstone to a lot of my thinking. As I said, I wasn't involved, so I can, I can say that with uh, real clearness. I, I remember being sort of overwhelmed the first time I came. They, uh, they sang for an hour and a half. I was totally bored. I already knew how to sing. I'd been a professional musician. Um, I didn't think they sang that well or that well in tune. <laughs> uh, they didn't know a lot of songs, and they, they, some of which, some of their songs were Jesus people songs. And every now and then, Carl would introduce a campfire song he had learned at one of the youth retreats, and they were a bore. <laughs> I think the the peak of that was uh, Father Abraham. He <laughs> because I, I I I don't want to tell on Carl because he's my friend, but. Uh, I, that kind of gives you an idea of where he was at that moment. And uh, then they would in intermittently um, just burst out in testimonials of uh, how God was dealing with them. And um, was, the first time I went, which is about the eighth week, I thought, this is dumb. It's hot in here. There isn't any leader. Because I couldn't see anything, anybody leading anything. But they were in full-scale revival, and I didn't recognize it. I didn't know their hearts were soft, and they were committed to God. But I, I couldn't see it. And I, I, I was as dead as you can be and still be a Christian. And I, I was still a Christian, but I, I was worn out in my soul. And um, that first night that I came, um, I heard that... Uh, a couple of the leaders in town had heard about this group and had come to the meetings, and they'd gone away and discussed and say, "Well, that's that's no group. That's just a bunch of old old people and kids." And that's what it was. I would say about 15 people that were in their 40s. That's old people, and uh, probably about 150, depending on the night, uh, of people in their teens and early 20s. And so they sort of discounted that group. And by the time I came, uh, my, I remember leaving that first night, and my wife said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, it, it's not going to go anywhere. They don't have a leader. And she didn't say anything, but she stifled a response because the Lord had already told her I was the leader. <laughs> so in one sense, I wasn't being as negative as I was being used. God was showing me the leadership vacuum that they needed somebody to lead them. Of course, my only problem was that I was just about as close to, to being dead as you can be and still be a Christian, spiritually. I was 
dead and dull in my spirit. A dead strong word, and it's not a very, it's not biblically sound to say, because I wasn't dead, I was alive, but I knew I wasn't very alive. I was really worn out. And uh, over the next few days, I was traveling a lot at that time, over the next few days, I just couldn't get them out of my mind. I kept praying about them and thinking about them and thinking, you know what, all they need is somebody to point them and, and show them what to do. And Of course, I didn't know it was, I was supposed to do it. But my wife knew, and she was praying, oh, God, get him, oh, God, get him. <laughs> my wife is very good at reducing prayers to bottom lines, you know. And... That was in um, the summer of 77. And a church was spawned that became Vineyard Anaheim that now has, uh, we're moving towards 700 churches in 41 nations. And those kids that were never going to amount to anything have probably affected more than 3 to 4 million Christians in over 100 nations. And the um, beat goes on. It's, it's expanding, not declining. And I know that there are those who would say, well, this group or that group or that leader has removed himself, therefore the vineyard is no longer what it once was. And I tell you, that's just not true. We've been told, I've been told for years and years that uh, if such and such leaves, they'll take half the movement with them. To date, in all, we may have lost 1% uh, of all the vineyard churches, but we've never seen a blip and, and, you know, otherwise, uh, uh, in terms of graphically illustrating the growth of the church, we've never seen a, a weight loss d decline. It's been just growing and growing. In fact, it's growing at uh, the first 10 years at 1,100 percent, and it's growing right now at about 7. And so um, it's growing. It's, it's harder to grow a larger mass, by the way, than it is to grow a smaller group. And so the, the figures have changed, but the momentum is powerful, and it's accelerating. And so that bunch of kids grew up, and along with them grew up hundreds of other kids, thousands now, that have affected the course of the church the world over. And we haven't gotten to every nation yet, but we're in many. Uh, we have 41, as I said, recognized vineyard countries where there are vineyard ministries that we have recognized going on, but we think there are about 25 other countries that uh, we have not yet been able to get to, that have, have churches that have said we are vineyard, we, we came out of the such and such group or out of the such and such meeting, will you come and see us? So we're going along and kind of Bob and Fulton and I with a broom and a shovel and trying to clean up after the parade. But the Spirit of God is accelerating, not, not decelerating. Uh, things are happening now faster than, than we could even keep account of. In that course of that time, uh, a number of things came together for me, one of which was a theme that I'm going to teach you on the night that I've approached many, many times. It has to do with the idea of the kingdom of God. Now, you've got to know that in 1975, when I first went to Fuller Seminary in Pasadena, a man was still alive and teaching then named George Ladd, and he was sort of a stuffy old academic uh, First time I met him, I mean, he was a classic absent-minded professor type. First time I met him, he found a tuna sandwich in his coat pocket that had been there evidently all week. And uh, he said, oh, my wife will be glad to know I found that. <laughs> At the same time, he was uh, a brilliant, I think, uh, theologue. And he picked up a theme, I believe, from a man named Him Herman Ritterboss, who uh, was a South African that had taught on the kingdom of God quite extensively, wrote a wonderful book on it that's a little bit heavy reading because it's written basically in th theology uh, forms. Uh, but it's a helpful book, and uh, if you can get one, they're, they're not in print any longer, but you can find them occasionally. I'd encourage you to get it and w wade through it. But George wrote a bunch of books, and uh, most of them have n are not out now. The, the, many of them are out of the way, but uh, there's three or four that are very important that are available. And one of them is his New Testament theology, and I encourage you to get that. But basically, as I understood what they were trying to say was that 
Jesus Christ is king. He was never less king at any period of time than he is right now. He's never, he'll never be more king in any future than he is right now. But he has not yet fully consummated the kingdom that he initiated when he came to earth. When God broke in to our world, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the incarnation, the babe called Jesus, a, um, a presence was established that was flesh and blood. And we saw, as the scripture depicts it, the spitting image of God. Uh, we, we saw Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We saw uh, through his uh, cameo appearance, really, a, a picture of God and his nature, his makeup. And so when you look at Jesus, it's, it's somewhat like uh, looking at God through a lens, a colored lens, but nevertheless a lens. To see Jesus is to see the Father. To know the Son is to know the Father. And Jesus talks about that many places, but John 14 is one of the more interesting ones to me. In any case, um, <clears throat> Jesus came preaching the kingdom and teaching those that heard that message, the apostles per se, that they were to pray, that, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now that is still a work in progress. But in every generation among every people since then, nearly 2,000 years now, there have been people that have heard it. <gasps> a king has come and, a, and he's coming back. And when he comes, when he came the first time, he came as suffering savior. But when he comes back, he'll come as conquering king, lord of all, judge of all peoples. Choose this day who you're going to give yourself to, who you're going to follow, who you're going to seek. And with that message came a ministry that was illustrated first in Jesus, then in the apostles, then in the apostolic legate, and then in every generation intermittently since then. Although there have been periods of times when various cultures have resisted that message, and quite successfully, and ours among them, um, there's never been a time that I know of in church history where the presence of the kingdom of God was not being evident somewhere on earth among some people. In this century, we've had the greatest outburst of the kingdom of God in all the history of the church. Largely, it began in a ministry among Pentecostal folks, or what became Pentecostal folks, in Azusa Street, Los Angeles. There had been a revival the year before in Wales that, was, that among evangelicals was valued and highly touted, and it ought to have been, that produced approximately a million converts in uh, 16, 17 months, 18 months. But the meetings were characterized primarily by worship and testimony. There was very little preaching, not unlike current things that are going on in the world today. And as a result of it, the, uh, those that came along and, and looked at it, like G. Campbell Morgan and other very distinguished men of God in that day, said this revival isn't going to work. It isn't, it isn't. It's a revival ex of experience, but not a revival of reality. It, uh, they, they don't know the word. As it turned out, sociologists uh, some 10 years later were trying to measure where the converts went, couldn't find 900,000 of the million converts. They weren't in any visible church. And so that tells you something right there that, that uh, perhaps they were touched by God, but were they permanently set in the kingdom? Well, that's questionable because the, the uh, whales, like the rest of the, <clears throat> the United Kingdom, has uh, state churches and state churches are a little careless and a little confused, I think, in their uh, understanding of who's Christian and who isn't. If you're a child, you've been baptized, and you're in the parish, you're a Christian. Whether you go to church or not, and whether you have any evidence of Christ or not, really means little. But 
not that, uh, that's a little bit of a disservice to some of those my brothers in the Anglican Church because there are many that are evangelical that would say, well, wait a minute, we, we believe in all the cardinal evangelical doctrine, and they do, uh, but the church as a whole doesn't. And my point simply is this, that many people are counted as members of the church that really have, except for the possibility of being baptized, married, and buried, have never been in the facility. And so all I'm saying is this, that a year later, another move of the Spirit really sparked by the Welsh revival started in Azusa Street. Now, there were many other facets of it that I'm not going to go into, but that are particularly precious to Pentecostal brethren because of things that happened in Kansas and things that happened through various uh, persona. But underneath it was this, this uh, foment of revival, get back to God. And the difference being is that the revival in Azusa Street, however it's characterized, however disparagingly it's characterized by some, who would say basically, um, oh, they're, it's the last vomit of Satan. It's a, it, uh, you know, they're, they're speaking in tongues and rolling on the floor. They're holy rollers. Well, those holy rollers may have rolled, and they have, may have spoken tongues, but they got up and preached the gospel to every nation. So much so that at the present time, we're anticipating by the end of this century, 600 million people that are identified with some aspect of Pentecostalism, either uh, classic Pentecostalism or the fringe groups and or charismatic groups and or what is now called third wave, of which uh, many would think that we are the founders of that. I don't know. Uh, some people don't think so. And I really don't care. First, first of all, there isn't the third wave. This is the 333rd wave, at least, or maybe the 3,333rd wave. It's one continuing wave. God is gathering a people for himself. And there's momentum, folks. If you understand that with approximately 5.5 billion people on the face of the earth at the present time, there's something well over 1 billion of them are now in in some way identified with the kingdom, either in a nominal way as a, a state church person, either Catholic and or Protestant, or Eastern Orthodox, or in a more evangelical way, the, the way we believe, uh, the truth is that there are many people that are not bowing their knee to Baal, not consciously, but to Jesus Christ. We play a small role in that melu of focusing, and that focus is around a message that I would call the kingdom of God. I would say that it's a message and a ministry and <clears throat> a mission and that we've been called to it. And if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Mark, the first chapter, I want to talk to you a few minutes tonight about the kingdom of God and, and how it was unveiled, unraveled, uh, demonstrated in the scripture. And he says in the first verse, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then he prophesies uh, through the telling of the story of John the Baptist and references to Isaiah. Um, he uh, ought, to met, ought to mention Malachi too because he quotes Malachi here. But he says, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert. That's the Isaiah text. Uh, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him, and so John, so he, it's all one to John Mark, he means John the Baptist. So John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance, which was a baptism, by the way, of, of preparation, of forgiveness. And get things cleaned up! Jesus is coming! The Messiah is on the way! And that was, that was the the context out of which this message was given and the content. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. Don't you dig him? He must have been a generation Xer. <laughs> and this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I. So he was a signpost pointing to the coming of Jesus. He said, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down 
and untied. I baptize you with water or in water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And so John came as a precursor. John came as a, as a um, signpost, as I said earlier, as, an, uh, as a person preparing the community for the coming of Messiah. And then in the ninth verse, she, we are introduced to Jesus. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And as Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw uh, heaven. <clears throat> excuse me. He saw heaven being torn down, torn open, and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven and said, "You are my Son, whom I love, and with you I'm well pleased." Now I want to point out that at that point he had done nothing in a sense to please the Father except be pure. He knew no sin. I've recently written a song that I haven't released yet that said the only sin he has ever known are the sins that you and I have sown. That's the only sin that Jesus Christ knows of. He never sinned. Here he is approximately 30 years of age and he's pure. And the Father's well pleased. And that was preparatory to going ahead and doing the work. I remember years ago talking to Lonnie Frisbee, who at the time was battling impulses of homosexual behavior, but at that point winning. And he, he said to me, you know, John, they, they talk about the Jesus people. John, um, Lonnie was used probably to lead, historians tell us, about 85,000 people to Christ. Uh, that would look good on your record. And, he, and in the early days, he preached a rather mixed up message about Jesus coming back in a new UFO. Uh, but uh, sounds vaguely reminiscent of some other groups, doesn't it? Uh, but he finally got much, much of that sorted out. And by the time I knew him, he had a fairly clear understanding of what the scripture unveiled. In any case, he said, you know, they, they talk about some of these Jesus people as though they were all impure. He said, John, they were not impure. They were living their lives in accordance to the scripture. Yes, there were many people assembled in houses. And yes, there were both male and female. But they were living their lives in purity. And he says, part of the combustible activity of these communities was the fact that there was such purity. And it, would, it was flaunted, you know, unintentionally in the faces of the impure in the streets. And, by, and in that context, the gospel was preached and there was nothing to gainsay it. And so the community responded powerfully. And as you know, thousands and thousands of converts, perhaps as many as three million through that move of the Spirit alone. Not bad, huh? And so Jesus was baptized, as was prophesied, and the Father was pleased in him before he ever began his ministry. I would say to you this, God is easy to please, but almost impossible to satisfy. Any move you make, any attempt you make to draw yourself and your body, your, li your life into conformity with the gospel and to serve and, uh, through worship and or other means will please God. He's pleased by our attempts. But he's outrageously hungry to find a people that will walk with him and walk for him on earth. And the only thing, that, the only reason the advisability of the word outrageous is that it's, it, it's like never ending. It's never any. I've had a, I've had a heart attack. I've had a stroke. I've had cancer, and he still won't let me get it, stay out of airplanes. He won't let me stay home. He makes an, he wakes me in the night. Says you're going to Ohio. I've got some young people for you to talk to there. So, here I is. <laughs> and the importance of all that is just simply this: that that though the kingdom was there and the king himself embodied, was walking among us, this was challenged. In Mark 1.13, 
Uh, it says, as, as he was in the desert four days being tempted by Satan, he was with wild animals and angels attended him. Now we know from, from Luke 4, uh, 1 through 3, that he was, as it says, filled with the Spirit. The, the word there, the Greek word, could be translated as easily oozing with the Spirit. Jesus oozed with the Spirit. There was so much Spirit in him, it, he couldn't keep it contained. It flowed out of him in every way. It flowed out of him in his words, in his deeds, in his actions, in his activities. Jesus was a spirit oozer. Tell the person next to you, Jesus was a spirit oozer. It's good to know these things, isn't it? And so Jesus oozing with the spirit and being led with the spirit went off to fast and pray for 40 days and, the, and it ended up in the temptation of Christ with the devil himself coming at him and, and uh, dealing with him. You can study that at another time. But the, the point is, is that here's the king, here's the kingdom, and it's being challenged. It will always be challenged. There'll be a warp and a woof. There'll always be uh, attack, counterattack. That's the nature of kingdom work. Anybody that has any understanding of of my history and the ministry I've been in, know that from day one, I've had my detractors. I've had people saying this about us and that about us. I've been called everything from whoremonger to adulterer to everything and anything. But I tell you before God, none of it's true. All I'm doing is preaching this book and trying to live out in a viable way what it says. And frankly, I don't have time to stop and fight with them. I'm too busy doing the work of the kingdom. And so Jesus was challenged. You know, a later point, in historically uh, right, recorded in the sixth chapter of Matthew, for instance, we the apostles come to Jesus and they they want him to teach him how to pray. And one of the lines of the so-called Lord's Prayer is. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. One, actually. Not usually translated that way. Why would he teach them that? Because he had been led by the Spirit into an attack of the evil one. And he's saying, of the two options, I'd encourage you not to go that way. I would pass on that encouragement. Lord... Don't lead us into conflict with the enemy. There's enough stuff in us. At least Jesus could say, here comes the prince of this world, and he has nothing in me. And he had nothing in me. No inroads, no appetites, no history. There wasn't any accusation, there wasn't any appeal that the enemy could throw at Jesus that had any viability. Unfortunately, we that have sinned, even though forgiven, still have potential for sinning again, do we not? And so we cannot say with Jesus that he has nothing in me. But what we can say with Jesus is that because of his purity and because of his forgiveness, there is nothing right now that the enemy can use to draw me astray. But the gospel of the kingdom is challenged. And so here the king himself is being challenged through temptation. Furthermore, in, uh, in, Act, in Mark 1, 14 and 15, Jesus comes announcing the kingdom. This is the core of Jesus' message. He says, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Now we know from other texts that it was near, it was upon him, within him. I mean, it goes on and on and on. There, the kingdom was everywhere because the king had come. And he was calling people to his kingdom, gathering a people for his name's sake, that he might present them to his father in due course. And folks, that's still going on. That's going on right now, right at this time, in this building, among you people. There's a king calling you. 
He's on the phone. He's mentioned your name. Will you come and serve him? Will you give your life to him? Will you give all that you have and all that you ever hope to be over to his tutelage and command? When I was sitting on the other side of that dark crevice, that separation between God and man, I, uh, one night in a Bible study, I was going to, I was just early on, I, I heard the pearl of great price, just two lines out of the scripture. All of a sudden, I thought my heart was going to explode and go out of my body. I said, wait a minute. I said, I know this guy. He's a musician. He can't do anything else. Do you mean that if this musician wants to become a Christian, because I identify the pearl as Christ, that I wouldn't have to, that person would have to give up everything? Their career, possibly? In order to follow Christ? And the guy that was leading the Bible study wisely took off his spectacles and said to me, well, what do you think? I said, I think that's what it means. He says, well, so do I. I did not leave happy that night. <laughs> At the time, I had two albums in the top ten of the nation. I, had, I was right at the, the vortex of a career in music. I could smell it coming. I was beginning to get the calls and the big money offers and do this and do that, produce this album, do that album. The Lord says, I'll have that. He didn't say, I'll have that, and in return I'll give you righteousness, I'll give you peace in your family, I'll give you a good marriage and children that grow up and love and honor you. He didn't say, I'll give you a ministry of a large church. He didn't say, I will give you opportunities to plant churches all over the world. He didn't say, I will open nations to you. He didn't say that I will call you and set you aside for my service and use you over the world. He just said, give me that. <laughs> and then he put me in a plant, an assembly plant. I had never punched a time clock in my life. I was working in an assembly plant where people's hands were crushed. Not every day, but regularly. About once a month, somebody would come out with, her, with blood dripping down their hand. And I made my living with these things. I played 17 instruments well enough to play professionally. That's what I was. I mean, I was a living, breathing musician. Could play in almost any idiom of almost any group at any time. That, to me, that was what a musician was. And so, I would drive up to that building. This is as a Christian, having made the deal. I mean, I, I went in, and I took all of years of work. I don't know how many, maybe 12, 13, 14 years of writing. I was basically an orchestrator. That was my strong suit. Boxed it up, took it to the dump, threw it away. Took all the albums, all the material, everything, all the pictures, all the mementos, what residual stuff was left is stuff other people in the family had I, I didn't have. Took it to the dump and got rid of it. That's what it said in the book, right? And I knew that for me, m music had long since lost its pleasure. Even now, people occasionally say, don't you miss it? And I'll say, no. I don't miss drugs. I don't miss hangovers either. I don't miss marbles. You know, I played marbles when I was in sixth grade. I was good. <laughs> I, I'm 63 years old now. I can't find a marble to save my life in my house. How about you? Are you keeping some of those things in the past? You still got your Letterman sweater hanging up somewhere? I don't. I haven't had for 40 years. And my point is simply this, is that was then, this is now. And now I'm identified in Christ. I gave up my life. It was sort of a shock when I had the cancer and I went back to church and people were asking me, well, was it hard? And I said, what? Well, you almost died. I said, yeah. 
And they said, well, weren't you anxious about that? And I said, no. And they said, why not? And I said, well, because, uh, first of all, I'm very socially unskilled. I don't know what's going on most of the time. And, but second of all, I, I gave up my life in 1963. It was me and Jesus, we made a deal. I died and he lived. And I, it's been just color me Jesus from then on. That's, that's what we're doing now. We're living out Jesus Wimber life. Does that make sense? So I, I gave it over. Lock, stock, and barrel, mountain style, no holds barred. Everything that went to him. Because if I'd have kept any of it, it would have been, I think, detrimental. Later on, years later, when the, with the start of this movement, God began... Uh, letting me do a little of music, but it's been a constant problem. And I, I bring to the subject of our worship lots of problems as well as potentials because I have been there and done that. I've been addicted to the popularity and the visibility and the um, scrutiny of thousands. I've done concerts with 150,000 people in attendance. And I know that it's like drugs and shot in your veins. And so I'm frightened. At the same time, I unleashed the bag. Those in the leadership of this movement would tell you that back in 92, I believe, maybe 93, I started talking at a leadership board meeting, council meeting. I said, you know, we've got to start young churches again. The median age of our church planters is getting too old. And I did some graphing and showed the relationships. And I said, we've got we've to reach out. I didn't even know the, the nomenclature, Xers and, and all at the time. But I said, there's a whole generation of young people that have got to go out. And privately, guys took me aside. Todd Hunter, for instance, said, well, why? I said, Todd, you were 23 years of age when I sent you to Wheeling. He said, oh, that's right. Are you hearing me? And he, and he was the first church, first vineyard church, east of the Mississippi. And I did have to help him. He didn't know what Italians were, much less lapsed Catholics. And I had to explain what country western music was. I mean, he didn't know what West Virginia was. He didn't know what patches on your patches on your patches means. He'd never been among people that, some, many of which were living, you know, rather deep, underprivileged lives. And I don't mean that everybody he won or everyone that he established ministry in was in that position, but many were. And so I had to draw pictures and do some training, and we stayed around for about eight months, and we met every week, and I, I said, when you get there, this is what you'll find. And, and largely, it's true. There were things that I said that didn't come out just the way he said, just the way he, I thought, but most of it was true. If he were here, he would say so. And my point simply was this, that it, there is a, a role, a fatherly role, in which we can say, son, when you go over on the other side of the hill, this is what you'll probably find. But you don't change the message. You don't water it down. You just make it culture current, like that culture is. Don't become the culture, but communicate it within the culture. Now, that, that's a no, whole other message. So here's Jesus. He's said that the kingdom is here. And with that announcement, all heaven broke loose on earth. It did. Boom! Like a bomb thrown. All heaven was broken loose. And immediately we see the kingdom being demonstrated in his ministry and in the things he's doing. First of all, we see him attracting disciples. What are we doing here this week? We're in the early stages of drawing disciples. And I have an assignment. My assignment is to envision you. It's to the mission and purpose of Jesus Christ on earth today. The continuing ministry of Jesus Christ up until the time he comes is the ministry he had in the flesh in that day and it's the ministry of the kingdom. It's the message of the kingdom and the ministry of the kingdom. 
And so it's this, it was immediately shown. Before Jesus had done anything other than say, the kingdom is near, people said, hey, I like that. And they started showing up. Mark 1, 16-20, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, and for they were fishermen. He says, come follow me, that silver-tongued devil. Isn't he clever? No, he wasn't clever, and he isn't the devil. Come follow me. He didn't say, let me tell you about something wonderful somebody else is doing. He said, come on. You see, it takes a disciple to beget a disciple. Things beget in their own image. One of the reasons why the vineyard is ready at this, I think, perched at this time in history to spring forward is that we have thousands of disciples in the vineyard and hundreds of thousands outside the vineyard. You know I've had over 3 million leaders in my meetings alone that have heard what you're hearing tonight and have adapted themselves and adopted some of it, if not all of it. There's some people outside of the vineyard that are more vineyard than some of the people inside the vineyard. And that's the truth. Because they bought it. Oh, man. I'm, I, I, mm. One guy came to one meeting in Sheffield, England, a, a skeptic to say the least. Someone had to pay his way, twist his arm, talk him into it. He came along. He said, well, I don't believe in this, this teaching about this and this teaching about that, some of which was wrapped around or near what we were doing, but most of it was stuff other people were saying that sounds like. So he came along the meeting, and for four days, he just tagged around, bugging everybody, asking them questions. Do you believe what he just said? He was an engineer by trade and, and highly skeptical and highly programmed to what I would call a Western rational worldview. At one given point when, uh, during one of the moves of the Spirit, I didn't know him, he didn't, and he never identified himself to me. He had gotten frightened because the power of God was so... He didn't think it was the power of God, understand? The power of God was so evident in the meeting that he, the, the, this was sort of a banked auditorium, and he tried to run up one of the aisles. And he got about 10 feet from the door, and the Holy Spirit just slapped him on the back of the head. Bam! And down he went on his face, shaking and screaming at the top of his voice, let me go, let me go, let me go. I think in Dutch, by the way. <laughs> and so after several hours, God let him go <laughs> into the mission field, <laughs> having been to Jesus' seminary. He already knew the gospel. He knew the Bible. He just knew it from a perspective that discounts much of what is important, in my opinion. Now, the guy is so literal that he went off to India to train church planters. And uh, he never planted a church. Furthermore, he had never ministered in the spirit. Furthermore, he doesn't wear spectacles. But what he would do is tear a page out of one of my books, read the page, then take something out of one of the, out the outlines he had been given, read that, make some comments on it, and then take off his glasses and says, now we're going to pray and the Holy Spirit's going to come. I said, how long did you have to wait? He said, oh, sometimes a half hour, 45 minutes. Have you ever waited for 45 minutes for the Spirit of God to come? I have. Some of you are wanting to do what I do, but you don't want to start where I started. Which is utter dependence on God and it means you will look like an idiot about half the time. And you don't want to look like an idiot. And I don't blame you. Your flesh cringes from that. Nobody would be, I'll be stupid. <laughs> but following Jesus has that dimension in it. And if you don't know that, somebody has lied to you. You will not be cool. Coolness in Jesus is an oxymoron. <laughs> non sequitur. doesn't go together at all. And so the guy would sit down, because he had seen me do it, and wait. And this little group of mainly nationals, 
20 people was a typical class size. All of a sudden, somebody falls, somebody trembles, somebody shakes, somebody speaks in tongues. And then it would start. And he he learned he had literally written down what he'd heard me say and do. So he would say, more! <laughs> and things like that. Because that's what you do when you do this ministry. Now, it got... It's a little cleaner than I'm depicting it, but it's close. I, I never saw him do it, so I'm only telling you what his rendition. He told me that uh, he may have planted 60 or 70 churches that way. Uh, his boss wrote me a letter and said it's more like 600 churches that he has stimulated in northern India, Pakistan, and some other bordering country. I don't remember what it was. My point in saying all that is this, is that guy got one shot, and he took it and ran like a scalded dog. And he's still running. He's still training, and he's still planting churches. Are you hearing me? Now, he was a little older, and he was prepared theologically. He'd had some good training and some bad training, but it was a mixture. And the Lord sort of pulled him out of the negative downside and got him focused on the positive side that he had learned. My point in saying all that to you is that if the gospel is of the kingdom is being preached and the kingdom uh, message and the kingdom ministry is being illustrated and if the king himself is being offered, it will attract people, leaders people that want to do it too. And years ago, it was good news to our little assembly when I said, you get to play. Everybody gets to play. Doesn't matter where you are in the spectrum of your spirituality. You may have just come from doing drugs, but let's get on with it, man. Now, I didn't say it was preferable to do drugs before... <laughs> And so, yes, we often in those days would have words of knowledge about thievery and stealing and lying, about adultery. Yes, we did disclose sin in, in public meetings. I've pulled away from that in the last few years, not because I don't get the words, but because there's been so much abuse of that. But that's part of uh, the, the word of knowledge dynamic in Scripture. And it's not only for healing. But it's all for, so for sin and furthermore, it's for lost things. I still get a lot of those words. People that have lost things and I tell them where to go get them and they go home and find them or, or wherever and get it and write me nice letters. I've got quite a file of nice letters. <laughs> now my point in saying those three things is simply this, that the kingdom disciples were being drawn. The dynamic was going on. Andrew and uh, John, Zebedee, uh, his brother John in the boat were preparing their nets, and without a delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. And I mean, they were just ripped up out of their daily lives and followed Jesus from then on. See it? And you can read any of the Gospels, and you'll see it in that first couple chapters. John's one is replete with stories like this. And then now... And the message has been communicated. People have been, men, men have been drawn. And now it must be demonstrated. And it's demonstrated in several ways here in the first chapter of Mark. In deliverance, in Mark 1, 21 through 8, 28, it said they went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. And the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. The people were amazed at his, uh, excuse me, just then, a man in their synagogue who was posed, uh, possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, uh, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Well, the answer to that is yes! Not the victim, but the demon. Jesus never met a demon he liked. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And they did know who he was. And they did know he was the Holy One of God. And I would say this. Would to God the church knew who it is they're messing with. 
like the demons do. It's very difficult in our materialistic society to recognize that spirit realm is as real as material realm. Jesus is not less God because he's not on earth. Jesus is not less God because he has chosen to go to the right hand of the Father. Jesus is not less God because he's become man that we might understand God. He was fully God, fully man. He's not less God when he came as Savior than he'll be when he comes as King. He's always been God. And he's worth our adoration, praise, affection, and service. If he never does anything for you, he's worth your daily devotion the rest of your life and throughout eternity. After the cross, he owes you nothing. Who else has died for you? Who else has provided you a way of cleansing, wholeness, and perfection? Who else has called you to such a great enterprise as gathering a people for his name throughout the nations? So that in that time depicted yet in eternity to come, that's, that's well, the, the, the book of Revelation is replete with them, the multitudes of people from all nations gathering before the throne of God. And they've come there because people like you and me heard it, believed it, and acted on it. We stepped out. And we said, yes. I, I was going another direction, but I'm not going to do that. Now I'm going to do this. If that's God's call. Sometimes he says, no, I want you to keep doing that, but I want you to do this as you do that. And that's okay. Not every one of those kids that I was referring to earlier became professional ministers. But largely to a man and to a woman, they've never quit ministering. They've had ebbs and flows, times when they lost heart, but they've always been called back again and again and again. And I run into them all over the world in vineyards. So here Jesus is preaching his first sermon. Now it's hard enough to preach your first sermon without having one of your parishioners manifest. <laughs> and so the demon yells. Demon yells, the spokesman for the group. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nath? says, you come to destroy us. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said. Now the, the, the Greek there is very strong. It's, it's almost like throttling him, the demon. And so you've got to understand that it's, uh, um, our English language doesn't really do it justice. Uh, uh, colloquially or idiomatically, we might say, shut up! That would be much more like what D Jesus is doing. Now, had the guy said something untrue, the demon? No, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But it was not timely. The hour had not yet come that John depicts so clearly in the Gospel of John. Jesus didn't want to announce and fully reveal who he was at that point. The Father didn't want it. The demons have evidently were privy to the knowledge. We know who you are, the Holy One of God. It's germane for us to know that now, but if the, the parishioners at that time didn't need to know that. And so Jesus says, shut up. Come out of him. And the evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching? And with authority. Now they had watched the rabbis coax demons out on occasion. They couldn't get them all, but they could get, they could get some. By basically reciting the sacred name of probably some derivative of Yahweh. <clears throat> but this was a whole new bag. Jesus wasn't messing with that. Come out! Out they came. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. You start casting out demons down at work and they're going to know about it. <laughs> Hello? He's a young man. He's not as young now. He's in his 40s. Years ago, he was working in a building. I think they had about 3,000, 4,000 employees in this building. 
is the, for the County of Orange. And he was sitting in one of the services, and he said, is that true? Can we do that? I said, oh, yeah. You can heal the sick right in the parking lot or the cafeteria or at the next desk or in the hallway or in the bathroom, although the bathroom isn't preferable. <laughs> Especially you being male, don't go in. No, <laughs> I didn't say that. Um, so he thought, well, how does that get, how do you get that started? I said, ask God. And make, hi, how are you, a question rather than a greeting. He said, what do you mean? I said, when you get out of your car in the parking lot, say, hi, how are you? And somebody says, fine, how are you? And you say, no, I don't understand. I really want to know, how are you? Well, I'm actually, I'm not feeling all that well today. I've got a headache, and my 13-year-old boy is a pain in this, you know what? And I don't know what to do about it, and blah, blah, blah. Well, may I pray for you? That doesn't mean may I pray about you at some later date in some safe cultural way. But may I pray on you right now. And then do it right there. Grab the guy's head gently and <laughs> pray for the headache. And believe me, one way or another, fright alone, he'll get rid of that headache. <laughs> no, I'm playing. And so he started doing that. Pretty soon, people were coming and making appointments for the coffee breaks and the lunch so that he could advise them scripturally and or pray for them. I mean, literally, they were coming to his desk or calling upstairs to his floor and saying, is Mr. Cook in? And um, I, my name is such and such, and I've got a problem with my liver or this or that. Can I come? And Blaine was giving his time during the, the breaks, the, which was only appropriate. I mean, he was hired for the other time to do this kind of work. And over a period of about a year and a half, a number of people got saved, and a little revival started. Hello? at work. Hello? In a government office. Hello? The bureaucratic aspect of the office, they weren't happy about that. This boss said, what are you doing when those people come over and shake and fall down and stuff? <laughs> he says, I'm not doing anything. I'm just praying about their problem. Oh, which put him off for the first round. But then they'd come and watch. And pretty soon they'd say, well, you know, my back hurts a little bit. <laughs> You got anything for backs? Oh, yeah, we got plenty for everything. <laughs> and so when the kingdom is there and the king is there and the kingdom is broken in, invaded, if you will, into our culture, um, there will be demonstrations of the kingdom. One of them is deliverance, another is healing. In Mark 1, 32 to 34, it says, That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. Now, all means all. It's comprehensive. It means the easy ones. <laughs> And the hard ones. Hello? It means the easy ones and the hard ones. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. Now, I don't know if he healed everyone, but the implication of the text is he did. No one has ever done it since. Hello? No person, no one person, has ever been uniquely embodied with a power totally commensurate to that evidenced in the life of Jesus. And so we have bits of it, we have some of it, we have uh, together collectively more of it than we do individually. And there are some of us who are singled out to do, do it and give evidence and witness to it more often and the ministry of it, but no single person get, has it like him. And I think that's on purpose. And I, I, I've never done a meeting like this that at some point somebody didn't come up and say, will you, will you pray for me that I'll receive my ministry? And I say, oh, God bless you, you idiot. <laughs> you will never have a ministry. And folks, I just want to get that all taken care of right now. You're never going to have a ministry because there's only one ministry available, and it's his ministry. If you want to involve yourself in his ministry, you're welcome to come in. But you yourself, you uniquely, will not be Jesus Christ's replacement on earth. Hello? At best, you'll be his representative. And you'll always have to be asking, may I? Will you authorize? Will you empower? Will you bless? 
You'll have to come in humility and dependency. And in our culture, there's a propensity for treating Jesus like a jump start on a cold March morning. Thanks, Jesus. I'll see you up to heaven. Are you hearing me? I'm going to run this thing. Independence is the name of the game for our culture. And it sucks, to use a theological term. <laughs> Are you hearing me? You'll have to live all your life, as I did today, praying in a hotel room near her, saying, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. I'm here, but I have nothing to offer them. How about you? Now, if you'll get in touch with that, I tell you that's where I've started and that's where I've lived for over 20 years now. Always on the brink of looking like an idiot. Always a dollar short and a day late in myself. Oh, I know some things. I've seen some wonderful things. I don't know of myself. I don't know of anything that can happen now. So pretty soon we'll say, God, what do you want to do? And then it'll unfold. And every now and then somebody will mistakenly say to me, why did you do that? And I said, you don't get it. I didn't do it. I asked for it, but not, not specifically. I said, come Holy Spirit. If that covers that, I did it. <laughs> Are you hearing me? This is the present day ministry of Jesus Christ. It's not about me. Or you. It's about him. All glory to God. It says he drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. And I've already explained why he wouldn't. Furthermore, it was illustrated or demonstrated in prayer. In Mark 1.35, it says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Otherwise, let's get back to work. But Jesus could have easily said, I've been working. This is what I'm called to, utter dependence on my Father. I only say those things that my Father gives me to say. I only do those things that my Father gives me to do. And that through the Holy Spirit. Do you understand? You have nothing unless he does it. I have spoken to blind eyes and they have seen. I have spoken to people that have come out of wheelchairs. I have spoken to people that didn't. But as I became more skilled in hearing the voice of God, uh, the percentile went up of those that were healed. I waited on the Lord. Recently, I sat in a circumstance for three and a half hours waiting for permission for God, from God to speak to somebody. It didn't happen. So I didn't speak. I, I held my peace. I, had, I believed something really good for the person. But I am not boss. I work in tandem with the boss. And he didn't say to speak. On another occasion, a few months, a couple months ago, a month and a half ago, in South Africa, I waited for three days. I had a word for a man and a woman, different, not the same, not the same couple. <clears throat> and at one point the man was going through a very difficult moment and he was weeping and sobbing and and I wanted to go over and comfort him with the word that God had given me, but I didn't think for sure, I didn't know for sure that the word would be that comforting. And it's personal, so I don't dare share it with you. But um, so I said, Lord, if you want me to, to speak to him, if you want me to share what you've given me, give me a clear sign. After maybe 20 or 30 minutes of sobbing and, and ministry from others, well-meaning, good friends, he looked up with a tear-stained face and said, do you have something for me? Sure. <laughs> I had permission then. And then immediately after that, the woman that I had been praying for, it was clear that I could go, I had now had permission to go speak to her. 
She had been going through a very difficult circumstance in her private life, <clears throat> very challenging, and a godly woman, very challenging period of her life. And the Lord go tell her, said to me these words, go tell her it's over. And so I went over and in a fatherly way said, it's over. Put my hands on her, looked in her face, said, look at me, it's over. The battle's over. And it was. I've since talked to her. Excuse me. Since talked to her husband. <clears throat> and so all I'm saying is this. Jesus wasn't just some sort of religious person that had to get off to the side to prove his spirituality or in some way demonstrate his discipline over his flesh through prayer. He needed to go make contact with the Father in that way that can only be done in solitude. And I would urge you with all my heart, <clears throat> Jesus in another place in, in Matthew 6 uses the metaphor of closet. And I can tell you this, that time spent in the closet sets you up for the time spent outside the closet. I'm not very skilled at, uh, at prayer. I, I'm still struggling with it. I've been work It's one of the hardest disciplines I've ever learned. I pray all the time. I, do, I don't do it like all the classic models that are held up. I found that I can fall asleep in any position. <laughs> Kneeling, standing, sitting, whatever. And, and wake, wake up feeling like an idiot. I've tried to go. I've gone. I've tried to go on fasts of my own making and failed again and again. One of the worst ones was I. I went off to the mountains for three days, ostensibly to fast and pray. It seemed a very spiritual thing to do. But when I got to where I was going, the hotel that I thought I was going to was closed, and I couldn't find. It happened to be a holiday weekend, and I couldn't find. Uh, any place to stay, and I ended up down the hill, out of the mountains, in the valley, in a hamburger place, eating three hamburgers. <laughs> and I called my wife, crying and saying, told her of the terrible sin that I had just done. And she she said, oh, "Come on, hon, honey, I know you're not much." <laughs> that was very satisfying to me because I thought she did. <laughs> And she would still let me come home. <laughs> now, my point in telling you that failure is that I have learned a little bit about prayer, and there is a relationship between what happens publicly and privately, but there's no direct correlation in preparation. Years ago, I was asked on many occasions, and, and on one occasion, I think maybe said a foolish thing. Uh, basically, they were drawing an equation. Do you, how do you prepare yourself for these meetings? Meaning... Do you fast and pray and give yourself to God and do thus and so and thus and so and the, all these disciplinary things that are often depicted as some sort of heroic commitment of uh, discipline that has produced this effect. And, and I, I didn't mean to sound flip. I was just trying to tell them bottom line. I said, well, I usually have a Diet Coke and watch the news. And that was shared around the world. <clears throat> I guess that wasn't the right answer. <laughs> but all I was trying to say is, you guys, your religion sucks. <laughs> I, don't have, I don't have an ounce of energy for the exercise and the purifying of the flesh. You can perfume that sucker all day long and it still stinks. <laughs> can you not? And all I'm saying by that is, yes, there is a place for prayer. And I've been that place, and I know how to pray. But I'm not able to say with any authority that I've ever been able to give myself for hour upon hour, day upon day, like some have. And I think it's wonderful if they can. But I have been able to pray all day long. And I often pray for an hour or two at a time. But that's when the Holy Spirit gives me permission. And so in one sense, that time of intimacy and prayer and, and uh, reverence and worship and, and affection and demonstrated 
uh, interaction with God comes by his permission in my life. But so does everything else. There are times that I've sat on platforms with thousands of people and, and the Lord stumbled my mind wouldn't let me talk. Simply because I hadn't been obedient to something that he had told me to do. And I've had to stop what I'm doing, explain the problem, and then go be obedient and come back. And then it would t turn on again. And God would do it. And my point in saying all of that is pray, yes. But don't let the inability possible, possibly inability that you may have in taking on disciplines or the ability to take on these disciplines become the control of your spirituality. I am a Christian because of one man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He was pure, I am not. He offered me his reputation, his history, and his purity. I took it and gave him my reputation and my impurity. And that deal has stuck. Now going on 34 years, five years. And it's the best deal I ever made. And so Jesus illustrated, demonstrated, I should say, the kingdom through deliverance, through healing, through prayer. And then in Mark 138, uh, excuse me, I, I got that wrong. 18 and 19. Ah, oh, 38, 39. That's right, I jumped out of sequence here just because just I didn't want to leave out teaching and preaching. Because he did that also. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. Now, I, I would generally say that, that the difference there in, is proclamation in the streets, the announcing of the kingdom, the preaching of the gospel, and <clears throat> teaching in the synagogues, but that doesn't hold. The language doesn't hold. It's very difficult to, to speak in our cultural idiomatic uh, need for control of language and to think in terms of categories. But generally speaking, I think that, that it's not important at the assembly of the believers to spend your time proclaiming the gospel. Let's proclaim the gospel in the streets and in the marketplace and in personal alliances and settings. The ones that have come have come to the gospel and to the source of the gospel, the good news, Jesus Christ. Let's instruct and teach and, and, and help them, nurture them, and, and equip them to do the same. Finally, it's secured at the cross. In Mark 15, 33 and 39, it says, At the sixth hour, darkness came in the whole land until the ninth hour. And at that ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama zavathini, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I believe that was the cry of, the, of his human side, his heart. Because I don't think that, I, I suspect at that moment he was getting seeing the gulf between that relationship and that uh, intimacy, that, that the purity that he'd known as God and, and as a member of the family of God, of the triune member, and suddenly seeing the gap in a way that he'd never felt it before. And yet he was the one who was bridging that gap by the very deed that he was in. And I think he was shocked that in taking on our sin, he was momentarily separated from his father for the first time and the only time in all of eternity. And I think that's the cry that's of, the, of the perfect man in a horrific circumstance. And those that were standing nearby said, listen, he's calling Elijah. And one man ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes down to take him <clears throat> down. And he said, with a loud voice, Jesus breathed his last. And when the centurion who had stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. There was something in, of dignity that captured that centurion's heart. 
And I think he had a revelation at that moment that God, God had given up his life. It had not been taken from him. But Jesus Christ on his own terms had died. Oh, I'm, I think Satan was danced to the jig. I think he was, he was sure he had won the mighty victory. We vanquished the sun. And in a sense, he drove a stake into his own future. Because the cross that is the vehicle that brings us to the Father will permanently be used against him in time to come. And so the kingdom was secured. When Jesus said, it is done, it was done. Your salvation, my salvation, all of mankind was secured in that moment. That will respond, whosoever may. I know that there's dialogue about um, the exercise of our freedom, the, the human's freedom, and the, the sovereignty of God. And I, I suspect it's all the one thing. I think it was Ironsides that said that that entering into the kingdom of God over one side of the door, it says, um, enter in those that are predestined, elected to become. On the other side, it says, welcome all those who have come. Uh, I, I got it backwards. You, you understand. Uh, I don't know which way it is. I don't really care. I know God sovereignly rescued me. I know that through me, he's rescued thousands, men's, maybe t tens of thousands of others. Um, and through you, I suspect he'll rescue hundreds of thousands more. But it'll be based on the same dynamic, the same ministry, the same message, and the same model. I don't think you have to go to uh, look around for, and find this program and that program and this package and that package. I think, frankly, most of those things are uh, not very meaningful, and they become, in a very real sense, a Saul's armor to many. I suspect that, uh, that all you ever need is right here in the book. And all you, I can guarantee you, is what he will give you. It's consummated, this kingdom will be consummated at his second coming. Someday, we'll hear the shout. The bugle will blast. We'll all look up and we'll see Jesus coming, the head of the hordes of heaven. And my friend Dick, and I don't even know the process of how the spirit and the body is merged and how he's into, inst instantly made into the eternal being that's described there in Corinthians. I don't know how it'll be done, but I'll meet him in the air as we go towards Jesus. And I can't wait to see him. At my age... Many of my best friends are there. Heaven is looking better and better to me. <laughs> I'd love to sit down with old Dick and talk. I'd love to talk to Brent. I'd like to talk to Pat. I'd love to talk to Lynn. I've got a long list of friends that have gone ahead of me. Friends that worked with me. Margie. I don't know how many people we led to Christ together. But I would suspect three, four hundred. Margie was one of those kind of people you just didn't dare teach the Bible to. Because she believed it. If it was in the book, she believed it. So one day I'm teaching and I said, uh, you know, we've been all called to witness. And I was teaching out of Acts and explained what witnessing was and how you do it. And So she came up afterward and she said, well, you know, I have uh, three children and a, a new baby uh, and uh, I don't know how, what to do. And I said, well, Margie, uh, just tell your neighbors about Jesus. And she said, well, uh, my neighborhood is sort of, she wouldn't use this word, transitory, people moving in and out all the time. She said, it's hard to get to know my neighbors. I said, well, Margie, and I think the Lord gave me this. I said, I know you bake regularly. She said, yeah, I do. I love to bake. I said, when you bake, why don't you throw something in the oven to give away every time? She said, you mean an extra loaf of bread or pie or whatever I'm doing? I said, yeah. She said, well, I can do that. I said, and after you bake it, uh, put the baby in the carriage and get the kids and go along and give it to one of the new neighbors. She says, and then what? And then I said, and then tell them why you're doing it. She said, well, don't I have to get any training? I said, no. You've got it in your heart. Give it out. And so over the next... Uh, 
oh, five or six years, I would regularly, not every week, but a prob probably twice a month, get a call from Margie. Hey, can you come over and talk with me? I have this late, my new neighbor named Mildred, she's, she wants to know more about Jesus. And I became a closer. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of like in the used car language. She was the, the floor salesman, and then I became the closer. And so I would come over, and sure enough, they'd be sitting there, usually eating the cake or well, something. Margie, keep on giving up. She, pretty soon she was baking eight or ten items extra each time because she had all this network of people she was giving to. And they'd be sitting there and talking, their babies crawling all over the floors and crying. And, you know, young married people, they don't mind the noise. So I had to learn to live with that. And, uh, and the interruptions and uh, the kids running in and out and the ones that fell down and skinned their knees or cried or whatever. And mothers aren't distracted by that. And so I would sit and talk to them. And pretty soon, I can remember one gal that, I, that has gone on to be with the Lord since then. And I remember at one point, she was telling me all about the importance of a, a, really a cultish religion that she had been exposed to in her childhood. And um, I sang my, my magical prayer, oh God, oh God, oh God, help, help, help. And all of a sudden, the Lord said, ask her if, if she, what she wants to do. So I said, before you go on, what is it you want to do? And she, in tears. I said, well, what you want is to come to Jesus, isn't it? She said, well, yes. I said, well, why don't we do that, and then we'll talk about this other later. You know, we never got back to it. <laughs> Twenty years went by, and we never got back to talking about that. Now, my point is, folks, just be where you are. I remember another gal who I love very much who's still alive today. Uh, she was a big woman, a tall, big stature. Her husband was very big. And when she would get pregnant, I mean, she got pregnant. <laughs> and so uh, with one of her children, she was so pregnant that in the last month or so, the doctor told her she had to stay in bed uh, because of the size of the, the child. And she was just broken hearted because she had been doing things like Margie, winning her neighbors. And um, so she said, what, what can I do? And I said, well, Laura, God loves you, your witness. I said, you pray, and he'll bring people to your door. She said, he will? I, it was like I was handing her money. <laughs> she will? And I said, yeah. And over the next month, I don't remember the exact number. I think it might have been 11 or 12 different people rang that doorbell. And in so doing, rang the doorbell of heaven. And heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and experienced the forgiveness and the love that was personified in Jesus and in Laura. And several of them, I would think more than eight, are still walking with the Lord today. Folks, that's occupying until I come. And so I'm wanting to go to heaven if for no other reason to see my buddies that I worked with for all those years. Brett Rue was one of them. Brett and I went to about 22 nations together. We talked to hundreds of thousands of people. I want to see Brett. I love Brett. I want to be with him again. And so sometimes I'm, I'm more there than I am here. I'm, I'm thinking about it. I'm praying about it. I'm writing songs about it. Nobody wants to hear them, but I, 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 I do. I write songs about going to heaven. I, I think it's a good deal. <laughs> Don't you? I mean, I think it's a better deal than going to hell, right? <laughs> and so Jesus Christ will consummate this thing. A lad that I talked to about, you, you about earlier coined the phrase, the already and the not yet. We live in the already, but we're not yet in the consummated kingdom. But, but when he comes, when that heaven opens, when that horde comes, when that king arrives, and he becomes, in a sense, the plumb line of all judgment. Every right and every wrong will be separated. Every injury, every injustice, every ethnic, uh, economic uh, thing done in the name of themselves or anyone else will be set right. He is the plumb line. He's the standard. And he will separate those who have the appearance of religion and godliness and those who have the reality. And folks, 
we're supposed to believe that could happen any time. We know it's at least 2,000 years at the present time. And we know that in terms of the signs of the times, there are many that would say it's right around the corner. And I'm, but I'm not one of those. I don't know if it's right around the corner or not. All I know is that until he comes, I'm going to pour out the last drop of my blood to serve him and take my last breath preaching the gospel. And I've asked the Lord many times. I've said, if you're going to take me home, take me home right after I preach the best message I've ever preached. This isn't it, by the way. <laughs> Although it's not bad. But this isn't it. And my point in saying this is that there's no one else. There's nothing else worthy to give every ounce of your being to. There's no one else trustworthy. There's nothing else as wonderful. There's no one else as credible as Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so, run, don't walk into his arms and serve him diligently all the days of your life. In summary, I want to say this. The kingdom, we are in the already and not yet. But it's coming soon. It can and will happen. The break-in of God, the break-in of the kingdom will happen in your lifetime and through your person if you'll yield yourself to it. Now, yes, it is risky. One guy, uh, Gary Best, after hearing me preach, depicted it as a guy standing on a high dive without water in the pool. And Jesus saying, come on, jump. Jump and I'll fill it. <laughs> and I think that's very accurate. And frankly, he doesn't fill it until you jump. And then doesn't fill it until you're just about water level. Does he? I don't know why he does it that, exactly that way, but I know one thing, it sure reduces the descent to a stark terror sometime. Trusting God takes everything in you. And if it didn't, would it be worth it? If it wouldn't scare the hell out of you, how are you going to go to heaven? <laughs> I believe you sitting here tonight can experience the empowering of the Spirit, the equipping of the Spirit, and enter into the enterprise of the Spirit today. The continuing ministry of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, marches on. <laughs>